Hello, everybody. Welcome to, I guess it's week 42 or 43 of, of e &M 2020. Um, it's been a long haul, and this is the final meeting, um, final video that we'll put up on, on YouTube. Um, have a nice big group of instructors with us today. Um, I'm, it's, a, it's fun for me because these are all good friends and, and people that I enjoy meeting with. So um, I think what we're going to do is just kind of go around the table um, and see what thoughts each person has. And I think what we'll do is, is um, start with in the short term, like with the tools and the ideas that exist right now, what would you like to see? What would you, the, the instructors, like to see uh, happen in this field? Uh, you know, the next 10 papers that you review, what, what would you love to see them doing or not doing as opposed to what you usually see? And then later on in, in the hour, we'll, we'll ask, um, what would you like to see happening in this field five or 10 years from now? So I'm just going to go down the list of participants, given that we don't have a table and it's not round. Um, let's start. Richard, do you mind starting? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, initial thoughts about where the field's at and, and things that we could be doing. I, th I think that, um, uh, firstly, to say I'm joining today, a huge thanks to those who've really taken on the, the bulk of work with this, because it's been, it's been phenomenal, and I, I've had a very, very small um, uh, participation and input, so it's nice to just just join join at the end. But I know that um, part of what's been presented and what um, Jorge and Town in particular have pushed is that is the BAM framework, um, which is still, you know, was presented a few a few years ago, but is still fundamental to, to to how a lot of us think about about the field. And I think we still need to be doing a better job of incorporating those different parts of of the framework. So we're really good on the abiotic, right? We've done that for. For years now and including some of the remote sensing data and the new data that are coming out and, and finer resolution we can do all that stuff but but the challenges around incorporating in particular biotic interactions some of the new methods that are, are being put out to do some of that um that work using bayesian networks and other types of approaches um is is has been a bit of a something we've talked about in this kind of group for literally you know it's decades now almost isn't it so um but I think we're getting closer to being actually able to do that, um, both with the techniques and the data sets that we can use to parameterize it. So I'd love to see over the next few years, more papers doing a good job of incorporating biotic interactions and, and also um, movement, dispersal capacity, you know, going back just a few years ago where it was just, well, let's assume there's no movement or there's lots of movement. Um, I think that there's much better techniques that, that are out there for doing that and they're, they're beginning to come into the literature but I think um, in papers we, we see on editorial boards and that the more papers that can really push those um, areas forward uh, the better and one other thing I guess to, to add would be I just love to see new applications as well over the last few few years you know it's, it's this very simple concept that we use behind these statistical models and they've been applied in so many different areas climate change invasive species niche conservatism all these different areas zoonotic disease etc but it's really cool to see when people come up with just a good new application to, to answer a different question maybe in a different a different kind of area um, it, it's really cool to see even if the techniques themselves are not new models not not nothing spectacular and new but just a new great idea uh, that we we look at and go oh yeah I wish I thought of that. That, that that's a cool way of applying these techniques there's a, an initial few thoughts okay um Hannah I was hoping I was further down on the list okay Great. so um 
So by this point, I guess in the course, you, you've, you've all had um, a tremendous amount of information from a lot of people with very diverse backgrounds and, you know, lots of great, exciting new techniques. And, you know, you're probably bursting with all kinds of ideas. Um, and I think the things that I would want to emphasize are um, similar to what Richard just said, uh, don't lose sight of the BAM framework and how you are asking questions within that framework and making sure that you have some sort of theoretical basis for the, um, the way that you're asked, the, what is the theory behind what you're doing? Just because you can get an answer with numbers behind it, what do those numbers really mean? And you need to make sure that you understand the question that you're asking and make sure that that's framed very clearly. Um, because sometimes you get an answer and that's great, but it doesn't always mean anything in the greater context of the questions you're asking. Um, so that would be the first thing that I would say is make sure that you don't like, get so excited and lost in the techniques that you lose sight of the question. Um, and the other thing would be to make sure that you very clearly explain to other folks what it is that you're doing. I think um, with all of these new techniques, it's gotten to the point where a lot of these analyses are very complicated and it's very hard to um, communicate all of the uh, things that you did, all of the assumptions that you made, all of the settings for all of the, you know, um, all of the inputs that you put into these models. Um, then I think there's a lot of really good work going on now to ensure that we're clearer about the metadata that we include in our analyses. Um, and maybe that's going to come up with some of the other instructors. But I think that's the thing for me that um, is going to be really critical as we get more complicated and start to uh, introduce some of these new techniques, just so that both as reviewers and as uh, fellow scientists, we understand what each other is doing and talking about because there are so many terms and so many, yeah, so many different ways of doing things that uh, communicating that effectively is going to be more and more of a challenge. So those are my two things for now, for my next 10. Sweet. Let's see. Um, Jorge? Um, well, basically, Hannah said everything I was going to say. So I just endorse her entirely, 100% to stress. Keep in, the short, in the short term, the long term is, is a bit different. But in I will talk term, about long term later. Right thinking, what you are doing. Uh, be very explicit about everything you do. Document your pipelining in excruciating detail, maybe using the new protocols that have been proposed to, to, to document the pipeline. And think about those concepts that is, is not just uh, being pedantic that you make the distinction between realized and fundamental, between, between uh, potential areas and actual areas and things like that. Use your concepts be very uh, rigorous about documenting. And uh, this is a great field to be in. Corey? <clears throat> Hi, sorry, I need to um, fix the purple eyebrows here. Um, that's from teaching. <laughs> I like to see if they're paying attention. There we go. Um, okay. So this has been, you know, a nice experience for me. I'm, I'm maybe the lone deep time paleontologist here. <laughs> Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, what I would like to see in the immediate term, um, and this is kind of unique to, to my application of these techniques, is e &M used for good and not evil in the deep time fossil record. Um, so there's a lot of button pushing that is still happening in the deep time fossil record. And there's a lot of um, kind of heartening back to what previous folks have said, applying this method without thinking about the ecological theory that's important behind it, or even the evolutionary theory, right? So I, I've reviewed a couple of really tough papers for me trying to model um, families of dinosaurs. <laughs> and I don't even know 
what an ecological niche of a dinosaur family is, right? I don't, I don't know how to take this information and use it in any kind of way. I've seen trying to interpret ecological niche models as diversity instead of habitat suitability, um, which again, I'm not exactly sure where, where that connection is exactly. Um, and then I've seen some really interesting applications too. I reviewed a paper trying to um, apply niche models to understanding the evolution of language dispersal across the Indo-Pacific. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know anything about linguistics, but this is a very interesting application. So I think, you know, with all of these interesting applications, I'd really like to see some more attention to applying the method appropriately and making sure that that the data that you're putting in is is decent um, and and reasonable for the types of questions um, that you're asking. I also have a continuing fight over the use of GCM models to estimate past environments um, as looking nice and therefore being interpreted as perfect when that is very far from the case. Um, and I'd like to see not just me working on some methodological improvements of how to kind of incorporate the sedimentological record with GCM models to get a better sense of, of past environments. Because if you have a crappy set of environmental layers, then your niche model doesn't really mean very much in the fossil record. Um, more generally, I think it would be really helpful not, well, okay, I'll do this one first. I think it'd be really helpful kind of like Hannah was saying, to be a little bit more explicit about methodological choices, even in modern public, you know, modern ENM applications, we do a lot of like, I ran all of these statistics and I did a million times of cross validating and I did all of these fancy things to make sure that it's fine. And we just sort of state that, right? Without kind of explaining, this is why I did it. And this is the implication of those results. Um, and I think especially for, for new scientists moving into this field, it would help to be a little more explicit about I made this choice for this reason, and I made this choice for this reason, and I made this choice for this reason. Um, from a short term, where do I want the field to go aside, you know, generally, I want to incorporate dispersal, man. I'm really interested in how do we sort of integrate, how do we estimate dispersal better in an easy way, and how do we kind of integrate that into our niche models? Um, that's kind of where my thinking is going. Marlon? Okay, it's going to be hard. <laughs> but uh, I think it's harder I'm harder every with each person, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think what I'm going to say is just um, trying to put together what others have said already and just uh, remind like other researchers that despite we have to have a pipeline, we have to just be, be very clear about our methods and what we use and all that. There is no one pipeline. There's always different options and everything depends on what Hannah said, like what, what do you want? What's your question? And, and depending, every application is different and depending on your application, you have to decide for this method or the other. That's why I believe this course has been so great because we have seen many different options and there, is more, there are more options. So uh, just explore what you have to explore before deciding. And once you have decided what are the best things for your specific application, try to do it correctly and be very clear. And I think that's what I will have to, I would like to see in the short term, but of course a lot of things are gonna change. And that's one of the cool things about this field. Mona? Well, like Corey, I'm <clears throat> I'm always concerned when I when I review papers when the details are not there, and when the data are not the the quality of the data. I'm thinking about um, environmental data resolution, uh, presence data, uh, distribution, temporal and, and spatial. Um, the data don't support what the researcher wants to do, but the researcher just goes ahead and does it anyways. And, and so it's like torturing data just because, just because we, have, uh, we have many modeling algorithms and we can run many, many algorithms and then do an ensemble model doesn't mean that 
we can overlook the quality of the data. And if the data don't exist for the question you're trying to answer at a very fine resolution at the, you know, the most recent 15, 20 years, um, if data don't exist, cannot support the research question you're trying to answer, just don't do, don't do it, <laughs> don't attempt it. So a lot of times, and so I, I worry about the data, the quality of the data that goes, uh, that go into these models and, and how that, that details is, detail is lost in the presentation of many models, complex, um, you know, complex evaluation and so on and so forth. All that complexity is, you know, has no value if the, the data uh, that we use uh, are, not, are not curated and whatnot. And I think, I think there is this rush to have publications and to do research and have you know outputs, 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 um, and in that rush we we compromise um, the the quality of our research by by using whatever data we can get our hands on in the next two weeks and you know forget georeferencing that takes too much time. Let's just use whatever is available. That those kinds of decisions um, and. One, as, one other aspect that worries me when I read papers, so in the short term, what I would like to see, uh, another aspect besides being careful about data quality is being 100% being honest about the limitations of the data that you are using and the, you know, the, the uh, biases, everything. Put, explain in the paper how your <laughs> what are the limitations and the challenges uh, with the data and uh, the design of the study. I think, I think unfortunately, a lot of the papers that I read hide that or don't in the, you know, some supplementary material footnote, you have to dig, 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 dig to find the, the, the information. And unfortunately, some papers don't even include that. And then you have to you have to guess what what could be the some issues and some problems with the data used or the you know the parameters uh, the, the choices of parameters. So, yeah. Demaris. Right. So the next ten papers I'm going to review. I mean, you would do me a tremendous favor if you would really embrace um, what has already been said, basically embrace ecological theory and embrace um, conceptualization. So plus reproducibility. So, I mean, that's like an important topic for me that we can actually replicate and reproduce what you have been doing. And this goes hand in hand with, with what has already been said so that you, on the one hand, um, very clearly articulate the assumptions uh, that are behind your study, the assumptions that are behind your data, the assumptions why you chose those driving factors, because only with these assumptions we can properly judge whether um, they are okay, whether they are correct or whether there would be any fault in your studies. Um, but then also articulate the assumptions why you made specific choices in, in the model building, why those specific discrete choices like the algorithms that you chose, the, um, the complexity, how you parameterize those algorithms, so the parameter settings, for example, um, how you selected the variables for, for your final model, etc. So all of these things are really important to really understand whether the question you're asking um, is properly investigated by the methods that you are using. And of course, I would love if that was all properly protocoled in, in kind of a checklist or, or protocol, um, and we can see the accompanying code and data. Of course, it's not always possible with the data that would that already goes into the long-term goals that I would of course laugh if we would move towards um, open data, but, but really try to be as open as possible about all of the steps that you took through data preparation and uh, model building and um, model evaluation. And in terms of applications, I mean, I, I, I would also love to see just really some applications again, where it's not just about, um, improving methods or finding out about um, some aspects of the distribution of a species or composition, but if that really serves a purpose. For example, I would love to see more studies um, that actually use SDMs for informing 
um, policy, for informing monitoring, um, and things like that. Yeah. Gengping. I definitely, I definitely agree with uh, Demira that uh, the openness, the repeatedness. Um, I try to look at all my data and codes. I mean, when you submit the manuscript, uh, I, I'm I'm working on invisible in past. So this is the past manager side. This is the um, um, entomology department. So I think the people still confused with. Uh, uh, with the traditional model, like ecological model, not ecological niche model, like uh, demographic model or, or currency model, I'm still not confused with the model with the ecological niche model. So uh, the challenge I think that in this field is that uh, uh, past managers, they want to know that uh, the, the partition distribution at I mean, land scale I mean, level. So, what what's the partition with distribution with this past in this in this field? I mean, they want to know the high resolution. So the challenge I think in each model is to how to downscale the model prediction. So that's what we're facing that uh, uh, for the for the past management. So the past practitioner they they want to know. They want to integrate the information into the managed system, into uh, into the monitor and the balance system. So, how to incorporate the model output? I mean, be useful in the pest manager field to to put the prediction at high resolution. I think this this is uh, one of the, the field that um, short term challenge field. Mm -hmm. That's it, Luis. Hello, everybody. Um, I guess that something I would like to see more often is uh, the definition of the niche that people are modeling. Uh, I have noted that uh, I did a, a very brief experiment, like de defining in my methods. Uh, here we're modeling the realized niche or the existing, existing niche or the fundamental niche. And in, the, in those uh, experiments, we found that reviewers were super hard, like, no, that's a wrong assumption and blah, blah, blah. But when we just mentioned we're modeling the ecological niche, nobody asks questions. So uh, I, I would like, even, even if I'm wrong in my assumption that I'm modeling the fundamental niche, I guess that we should try to, to be more explicit on that because sometimes we read literature in which the interpretation of the models are sometimes uh, in the line of fundamental niche estimations and in other parts of the same manuscripts, they are more in the realized niche. So it's hard to, 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 to follow a, a, a line of, of the interpretation. Yeah. So in, in that vein, I guess that every time we design a study, try to go back and watch the first video of this course, uh, the, the Jorge Soberon video explaining those, those uh, niche. Enrique. Thank you. Well, first, uh, town, many thanks for making this happen. It's a tremendous effort on your side and, and we all appreciate this, not only, not only the, the students, the participants, but also we as, as uh, instructors really thank you for all your effort. And uh, regarding your question, I, I would really like to see more theoretical ecologists and, and uh, evolutionary biologists involved in this because it's true that that you guys, you Jorge and, and, and you set up this this BAM framework, but it, it's still insufficient to understand all the complexities of of uh, of the whole topic. And I think there is a, a very strong bias in the field to be oriented as, as a bunch of techniques rather than a, like a, a field of knowledge. And I think this is because we, it's much more people in, involved in, in the implementation side 
in the application side, which is wonderful. But I think we, we are still lacking a lot of, of effort in, in, the, in, the theoretical, in the theoretical part and how the theory links to the implementation to understand what the, the limitations are and how can we progress uh, to overcome these limitations. So that's what I would like to see in the, in the short term. I, I think you've, the, the participants have gotten 10 very good pieces of advice and they're kind of all interlinked. Um, you know, one major theme is certainly placing your work in the context of, of theory and the theory is going to come from uh, ecology and biogeography. And that maybe the second part wasn't emphasized as much, but the whole idea of M in the BAM diagram is about biogeographic limitations and how that interacts with um, how that interacts with the models that we fit. Corey points out in a in the chat and evolutionary theory. Definitely, Corey. Definitely, definitely. Which is to say, we've got these these bodies of theory that we and our colleagues use and study, but then we're presented with a tool like niche modeling, and sometimes there's the temptation just to forget about all that theory and press the button and publish the map. And that's that's very dangerous. In fact, I'll, I'll go beyond what several of you have said about you know, documenting the assumptions and documenting the choices. We're dealing with assumptions, a whole string of assumptions, very complicated string of assumptions. And we can probably build an argument and cite a couple of papers for any decision that we might wish to make. So I think really what we should be doing not just publish the code, not just publish the data, not just not just justify the assumptions, but picking out a reasonable number of those decision points, we should do both. So if you say I'm going to use uh, a maximum entropy algorithm and not a, a, a uh, linear model of some sort, or if you say I'm going to uh, rarify my occurrence data uh, based on, on density patterns versus based on country uh, representation, or if you say you're going to use a, a bias surface or not, or any of a hundred decisions that we've talked about in this course, there's no clear and unambiguous understanding of what each of those assumptions will mean. And there's definitely no understanding of what the whole set of assumptions will mean. And I know that you know in the KUENM working group, people hate me. They don't say it, but I know that they hate me. Yeah, but not anymore. Hannah, Marlon, Corey, Gengping, Luis, uh, Mona, uh, Enrique was too far back. Um, but I know that when I make my comment, which I always make, which is, yeah, I'm not convinced of, of the justification for that assumption, so let's do both. And you do that for two things and it's four, and you do that for three things and it's eight, and people start hating you, okay? But what it does, it's, it's what's called a sensitivity analysis. If you do both of those, you, if you explore both of those options, whatever the decision is, if you explore both and the answer is pretty much the same, then you can eliminate that factor. But if one or two of those factors that you explore cause your results to be dramatically different, then you have to come back to that in your discussion. You have to think about, is there a clear theoretical basis for choosing one or the other? Or are both of those within the realm of possibilities? So I think 
you know, beginners in this field and even experienced people in this field, we've got a huge number of, of challenges. We need to, you know, break out of our methodological constraints and look at the tools that are being published by other sectors of the field and not just continue in our, you know, our track uh, or within our set of constraints. We need to be open about the data, the tools, the methods. But I think we also have to be honest about how little we know about what those assumptions that we make really mean as far as the conclusions that we want to derive from our work. I'm kind of going to be the pessimist in this, in this group where I think there's a lot more variance in the results that we publish than what we appreciate when we publish those results. I, I just wanna jump in there, Tom. I also think that needs to be okay, right? It needs to be okay that, that we don't have all the answers just yet, right? And that this particular analysis is just one piece of a much bigger puzzle. You know, I get a lot of like, what about competition? What about, you know, and I'm like, how many times do I have to say, I'm only looking at abiotic stuff. Like I'm not saying anything about biotic interactions, those could be the most important thing ever. I'm not testing that, <laughs> you know? And this model only tells me one thing. You could have any number of ideas about other things and that's awesome, but it has to be okay that I have one test for one thing and that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I think that it's also gotta be okay if you state, I'm making this assumption I'm testing the, the importance of that, of that assumption, and I got very different results. That also should be okay with the reviewers, where it's better to have tested and seen the variation than not to have tested at all. It's called honesty. Other comments about short term? That's a lot for short term, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, we all review lots of papers. I suspect that between the 11 of us, we review some very uh, non-trivial section or proportion of the papers in this field. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of good that's coming out and there's a lot of not so good that that at least gets to the being reviewed stage. Well, there's John Wachorek. Sorry, I, I got called in to save the genomics world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you did that, and you're only what half an hour late, so you've had a good uh, a good morning, John. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Dan, we just went around the table and um, and each of us gave a comment about what we would like to see in the short term in this field. So, you know, the next 10 papers that you review, what would you love to see people doing or not doing? You know, if you have a, a thought about along those lines, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna talk about what would we like to see this field doing in the next 10 years, you know, long term. Any well, mine's easy. I'm, I'm so narrow-minded that you can already guess that I would like to see demand from reviewers that the data that are used be rigorously usable. Yeah, I think Mona made that comment of there are points where if, if the data are not so sufficiently robust to support a study, you should be so honest as to walk away and not do the study. Yeah. No. And if you're not, everybody else knows how to catch it and say, no, 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 no. Outside of vertebrates and North America, the proportion of data that are openly available, like GBIF data, that have the full metadata for the georeferencing the proportion is 
vanishingly small. I am about to engage in a study that I have to do for my own edification of how many, what percentage, let's say, of the occurrence records published through GBIF are demonstrably impossible in terms of their georeferences. And I'm not talking about the latitudes and longitudes. I'm talking about the whole basket. There's so many that have these default values for uncertainty that are ridiculous and this, sorry. I, I got into trouble with a senior colleague a few years ago where in a publication, I, I, I have to admit that I mocked uh, a locality descriptor that was on a specimen tag. It was referring to some, some uh, village in Chiapas in Southern Mexico. And the lo locality descriptor was 14 miles northeast, 10 miles southwest <laughs> of, and actually this colleague who had written the, the label came back and defended it because apparently the, the road that goes out of that village goes like this and then comes back like that. But you know, you, you could have <laughs> described it a little bit better, my friend. <laughs> okay, so, so that we don't go terribly over time, um, let's now think about long-term. You know, the, this, this field as, as a set of tools that is referred to as ecological niche modeling has been around for, what, 20 plus years. So uh, how about if we ask, you know, what do you hope to be doing or what do you hope to see others doing in a very positive long-term sense 10 years from now? Let's see, Corey, and don't, don't just repeat, you know, using good data. Uh <laughs> no, 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 um, this is great. I mean, it's sort of like, uh, what's my research programming moving forward? Um, so the first thing that I'm working on now and that I think is gonna take a little work, I don't know if 10 years is quite as long as it'll take, but it'd be nice to get more people involved, um, is the idea of niche stability of a species across its entire lifetime, right? So this is something that we assume when we use modern data. You can't do any kind of niche comparison unless those niches are in fact stable, right? Because otherwise those comparisons don't matter. Um, so as someone who works with the fossil record, we have a nice unique record that we can try to actually plot through time, the environmental space that a species is occupying. We know that species live a million years, sometimes five, depending on whether you're a clam or a mammal. Um, and so it'd be really nice to get a sense for how niche stability works. And this is not without sort of um, a theoretical or conceptual um, challenges, right? Because we have this issue of um, preservation quality and where do you find the data? How do you sort of estimate the environment, um, especially in deep time in a meaningful way for that particular animal. Um, we have to think about the question of adaptation um, versus um, parts of the fundamental niche that just aren't existing at a given time period, right? So um, there are a lot of sort of, of, of things to think about in trying to solve, sort of assess this, this problem. Do all species show niche stability? Do only some? What is the climate regime under which this works, right? So if you have um, glacial interglacial cycles, it seems like that's a pretty good assumption. If you have a greenhouse ice house climate change, right, a, a 200 million year switch from high CO2, atmospheric CO2 to low, you know, is that, is that assumption still held up, right? Um, the other thing that I would like to look at more is um, phylogenetic niche conservation, um, and then using kind of the fossil record to help you know, we'll, we'll never quite estimate ancestor descendant relationships truly, but we can at least get a sense for kind of who comes before who, right? And so kind of extending that sister species comparison um, to a deeper parts of the phylogenetic tree using fossil data, like that's, that's sort of, and then all the, method, all the methodological problems and conceptual problems that are kind of associated with that. That's, that's kind of what I'm interested in. And then dispersal, right? 
Marlon. Okay. Um, well, I think there's there's two things that I would like to see in the long term, and although Richard mentioned this in the short term, but I, I believe that it's going to take a little bit more time than the short term, the biological interactions, like try, trying to just to understand better how biotic interactions can be can be inserted in our in our studies, not not models necessarily, but in our studies regarding species distributions. And I think that's crucial. And I think it's really hard because biotic interactions are like that, are hard, like are local sometimes. They are not the same in different places. And they are different communities are different in different places. There is a lot of uh, local things that are going to be hard to insert and are going to take us some time to understand and to see what happens if that can be generalized for the entire species range or not, or how are we going to do it? I think that's going to be really interesting in the future, uh, starting to integrate more tools uh, and more theory in our in our studies. And like regarding the local things happening in this uh, uh, in the study of species distributions and niches, I think uh, another thing I would like to see in the future is uh, inserting more uh, these ideas of local adaptation for distinct populations to conditions that are so so macro like climate, but that also man manifest so micro because they can be so local for certain species like can depend on how trees tree cover is in a certain area and stuff like that. So I think it'll be really interesting, really nice to see people bringing ideas from other fields to understand those things in local terms and then trying to go more and more to a broader extent and see what that makes to our predictions for future, for instance, if that's possible in some, in some way. Luis. Uh, yes, I, I, I wanted to, to talk now because I was going to say exactly what he said, uh, what, what Marcon said, in that now we are working in the BAM diagram, but actually the modeling framework is in AM diagram without using the biological, the biotic interactions. So I would like to see more of that in, in the future. Hannah? Yeah, I think for me, um, the thing that I'm really going to want to see in the future is to more explicitly incorporate our ideas about evolution into our ideas of macroecology in terms of species distributions. Um, maybe this is on brand for me at this point, but um, yeah, so not just taking information that we've gleaned from species distribution models and putting them on phylogenies, but trying to understand how relationships among species can actually inform how we understand uh, macroecological patterns as well. So the macroecology can inform biogeography and phylogenetics, but phylogenetics has a lot to give us when we when we're trying to understand macroecology and biogeography as well and sort of thinking about these things in terms of deep time history also um so i'm sure corey will back me up on this you know a lot of times when we do biogeography we're assuming that the climate has been pretty stable uh, when in reality, climate is probably pushing species to change their distributions all the time. And it's not just a matter of, you know, okay, we know that India drifted across the ocean and hit Asia. There's more going on than that. And I think by strengthening these interactions between macroecology and evolution, we may get a much better picture of biogeography and the ways in which all of these um, issues interact to really form the full um, way we understand life. Ping. For me, I think that the long-term challenge is still how to improve model uh, transferability. Um, I know it's impossible for 
collective niche model to I mean estimate the fundamental niche, but uh, but we still I mean think about how to improve how to approach the fundamental niche, how to improve model transferability. And there are several studies that they I mean several senses that they come they came up to the conclusion that niche are largely conserved. But uh, still, see that uh, there are limited transferability of niche model. I mean, for invasive species. So that means that a lot of transferability is still, I mean, uh, reported in some studies. So I think that uh, this is the it's a long term challenge that to improve model transferability. I mean, to make the uh, for for the correlative niche model to estimate the fundamental niche. To make the model more meaningful, yes, that's what I'm thinking. Richard, a comment before you have to go. Oh yeah, sorry, I I need to head out. Um, thanks to everybody. I guess just a a very brief um comment. I, I was going to pick up on the same point about scaling and and kind of building in macroecology and, and more local ecology. And there's just so much work and promise in in linking those fields. And a very general point, um, hopefully not too general, is just about um, publishing all these papers open access increasingly. I think they all should be open access in 10 years time, um, but also to think about open education. So I think one of the just fantastic things about this course that you guys have run is that it's just free and open to everybody. Um, so I hope that there'll be more of this kind of thing and using these kinds of resources um, uh, and a community around educating, uh, you know, other people to get involved um, uh, in, into the future. So, well done. Thanks, Richard. Take care. Mona. I'm gonna go, uh, well, it's, it's related to what Richard said about scaling. Um, um, I'm gonna refer back to Marlon's comment. I, I hope, I'm interested and I hope that we can, we can do better in the next five to 10 years. We can do better in terms of starting to quantify microclimates and, and start, to, start to transition from these um, interpolated large, pixel uh, climate data, um, start transitioning towards variables that, predictor variables that better capture what the, the um, species experience <laughs> uh, or are exposed to uh, in terms of environment. So I think that's, to me, that would be really exciting to be able to get to that point. Um, there's a lot of there's also a lot of talk. Um, so second, the, the um, so related to sorry related to this micro scale view of or microclimate uh, view of the environment is the scaling up. So if we can, if we can from an ecological theory um, point of view, if we can do um, scaling up like really scaling up of processes, uh, not just physical pixels scaling up. <laughs> Uh, that will be, I think that will be a major um, theoretical uh, advancement in terms of um, organisms relationship with the environment and how that, how those affect uh, distributions that we see at larger uh, extents. Um, having more physiologically informed um, ways of running models, uh, that has been a, a hope and a quest for me for a while now, and I'm not making much progress in that world, but hopefully other people will um, sooner and, uh, and better. And then lastly, there's a lot of talk about data integration um, from satellite all the way to in situ. And um, we don't have, I don't think we have a good theoretical framework again for scaling up and with that, without that good ecological framework for scaling up, all, all this talk about data integration from in situ all the way to you know, large data sets, remotely sensed data sets, uh, makes me um, uncomfortable. <laughs> so I'd like to see more, more advancement in, in that theoretical um, framework of 
of scaling up of processes before we start again throwing all kinds of data at complex models and saying we are doing you know everything from space. <laughs> Jorge. Uh, in the long term, well, I'm going to divide what I would like to do myself and what I would like to see others doing. Uh, myself, I will be working, as I am right now, on including uh, movements and biotic interactions in a dynamical uh, sort of scheme where you have not just uh, the static prediction of what is suitable, but act the actual thing uh, of the species moving. That um, <clears throat> implies something which is very difficult, which is the, the history, because you need to, if there are movements, you need to postulate where from, and where from is a historical question. So the area of the distribution of the species started where and how long ago, and that makes things truly complicated. But uh, we are doing advances on that, so I will be working on that and I hope that we will be developing a nice theoretical framework and tools. Of course, the tools will be done by Luis Osori, no, not, not by me, but Luis is capable of programming practically whatever. And uh, so um, this is what I would like to do myself. But I would like to see other people doing more evolution and certainly this scaling thing, linking what the individual experiences at physiological levels, behavior. These stupid lizards go and dig a hole if they are too hot outside and then your niche go bust uh, and that sort of thing. So more physiology, more, uh, more uh, behavior, more microclimate, habitat structure, those are very important things, and I hope to see that being included in, 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 our, in our thinking. And of course, the evolutionary part, uh, micro adaptations, maybe the niche is not convex as we have been praying for decades. Maybe, maybe if your species is spread enough, there are going to be niches here and there and there, and the entire niche of the entire thing is, is horrible and, and like a cheese, uh, Swiss cheese with holes and stuff. All the things that we say, no, no, that cannot be happened. That cannot be the case. Maybe it is the case. So uh, adaptations and evolution in the sense of uh, what is happening in long, in long uh, periods of time. I would like love to see that also being addressed systematically the way it's being done by some of you guys and by and by uh, Marlon and others um, uh, in and, and all over the world actually people are publishing this the, the the field is moving and that is very exciting John any last comment before you have to go been an honor to be part of this. I think it's been a, an amazing achievement what you've done here. Sincerely. Thank you for all the contributions because the the rigor with regard to georeferencing is is something that you know I've been around that question and around the work that you've been doing for for decades and I still keep learning about it. So Thanks for, for that huge contribution. Welcome. Keep up the good work, everyone. Enrique, any comment? Yes, Don, thank you. Uh, I think there's plenty of, of room for improvements in all, in all uh, aspects of, of the modeling process and in, in the conceptual side and in the implementation side. I really would love to see, finally, a validation metric that can help us all and with which we are happy, uh, for example. But most importantly, I think it's, uh, it's time to move from, from describing and analyzing patterns to understanding processes in a, in a dynamic world. 
uh, we we still uh, make pictures in terms of, of maps or niches, but uh, it's it's a static approach. Yet, yeah, and what Jorge is doing to trying to to move from static to dynamic, I think it's something that will really improve the 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 field a lot to understand all the complexities and 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 how things are changing. I agree with Jen Ping in in the fact that we need to make substantial improvements in terms of transferences of models for climate change or for invasive species and and very specific things like that in every step we need to to, to make progress so uh in in my personal agenda for for the field i really would like to to have a deeper understanding on how how this issue of, of linking patterns with processes can uh, really explain these population processes like like the abundance all all uh, topic on on modeling abundances but it's abundance is only one one expression of fitness and how to what extent this really can help us to understand this this uh, demographic processes or, or ecological processes. That's what I would like to see in the future. Maris? Yes, thanks. I guess I could make an endless list of what I would like to see in 10 years. There are like a number of things that I encounter even just in teaching where, where I see that a lot of things aren't clear enough or where we don't have enough tools, although we think we do. Uh, um, so these are small, big things. Like um, I think we need to invest more into pseudo absence selection or at least providing better guidelines for students how to do this pseudo absence selection. So this is, of course, related to, to the theory, to the BUM diagram. But I feel that actually there is more guidance needed to, uh, to train the new generation then um, also in terms of model selection, variable selection, I think there's still loads of room for improved guidance where we actually often feel that the field has all that already. But in teaching, I encounter that actually we don't have that. Um, we just have like an intuitive feeling sometimes, but we can't just provide a textbook to, to the students saying like, well, it's all there. Um, then I still think we need to improve on how we model rare species and uh, on this data integration that also Amuna mentioned um, on integrating observer bias. So there are still a lot of things that we can improve. And of course, personally, I would love to, or I will definitely work more on those mechanisms. So, I mean, already when I started working with correlative niche models, it was always like this, interface between um, correlative models on the one hand and dynamic models on the other hand so trying to incorporate dynamic processes like movement and dispersal um, trying to think more about evolution and adaptation um, but also about so this also involves plasticity in in species that um, there's there is maybe nothing like a universal species niche but we have populations and they um, um, might be plastic in a lot of um, niche aspects and I would love to see more funding for for these kind of things that we actually can move towards having proper biodiversity forecast to to, be, to get at a stage in 10 years of time where the climate community is already at that uh, that they can uh, put like very strong um well, statements on certainty on their predictions. And, and we can't do that yet. And we have loads of problems 
it's it's not that just the mechanisms it's also the bias in 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 the data we in the taxonomic bias and the available data um the regional bias and the available data so there are loads of reasons why we can't do like proper biodiversity forecasts yet and i guess like getting more funding would be a big secret uh, to, for success um and yeah just trying to really understand much better um, and trying to predict much better what is going on. I, I mean, prediction doesn't always need to be about forecast, but also just exploring those if what situations. So it can really be more about understanding, for example, understanding these legacy effects that uh, Roche mentioned, like what is the effect that uh, of the things, of the drivers that has been going on for the last 30 years. Like um, even if we would stop all actions, um, um, that is put that are putting biodiversity at risk at the moment, then population declines would probably continue because um, there is some extinction debt to to pay, and understanding all of these um, would be great. But I guess we need longer than ten years. Neat, yeah, a good a good set of reflections. Um, seems like the. A major current is is that of moving use of these techniques to something that is much more specific to what is experienced by the organism. I know there are a bunch of different ideas thrown out, but it, it seems like that that's the one that I heard most repeated. Um, and that's going to include scaling from macroclimates to microclimates. It's going to, not mentioned, but scaling from macro time to micro time. So think about what Kate Ingenloff presented with time-specific modeling. Uh, I would throw in moving to realistic response shapes being estimated by our modeling algorithms, because that will begin to address what Gengping and Enrique mentioned, which is improving the idea of model transfers, particularly when there is non-analog conditions in the in the transfer um, environments. Uh, I would throw in also a genomic basis for understanding these niche characteristics, and that's going to lead us to a better understanding of uh, how niches can evolve. You know, think of polygenic versus single factor genetic basis, things like that. That has major implications for how how niches will will change in long periods of time. Um, but you know, I think most of all, what I would say is, I really look forward to stopping talking about a field of niche modeling. It's not a field. If there's a field, it's something like distributional ecology, right? Why is a species where it is and why isn't where it isn't? And niche modeling or distribution modeling, if you prefer, is one set of tools. But we also have, you know, occupancy modeling and, and network analysis and all sorts of other tools that are relevant to this field. This field being something about distributions of species or distributions of populations with respect to both parts of the Hutchinsonian duality, geographic and environmental space. Um, I think in some senses, niche modeling has grown overly popular or overly exciting. And so you see over and over again in the literature, an ecological niche modeling analysis of, you know, the distribution of some species. That's not the point. The point is the distribution of the species. You know, we never see a linear regression analysis of, right? And I think, I think we need to start to see this is just a tool amongst many other tools, uh, perhaps a particularly useful tool because it produces these really cool maps that we all enjoy 
looking at and thinking about. But it's just just a, a thought that that the field is something bigger than niche modeling or distribution modeling. Well, we've we've gone over the hour. And Can so I just make one more comment, John? I was just going to say any any final final thoughts or ideas. Um, I would just urge also some kindness in how we review our colleagues, right? Because while we spend a lot of time thinking about these topics, you know, there are a lot of students out there that are just kind of getting their feet wet. And there are a lot of colleagues that we have that are just starting to kind of explore these methods and may not understand all the nuances. And I know that we all get barraged with paper after paper using niche modeling for evil and not good or for using niche modeling for purposes that really aren't appropriate. Um, but I, th I think it would behoove us to just remember that there are people behind the science um, and that you know we want to help make we want to help uplift this field as opposed to um, kind of weeding people out of it. I, I think that's a very, very important point. My solution to that is in it's probably about 92 or 93 percent of cases, I sign my reviews. That the only ones where I don't is where there might be some direct political implication for, you know, maybe one of my students or something. But I think if if science were to move, it's funny because we have this, you know, kind of optional signing system that's been the norm. And a bunch of journals are moving towards double blind systems. And I, that's that's okay, but it's never blind. You know, you can always guess, and sometimes you guess wrong. In fact, that happened to me with my dissertation advisor about somebody who reviewed a grant proposal. This is 35 years ago, and my my dissertation advisor guessed wrong, and was hateful towards a person who had not reviewed the proposal. I found out decades later. Um, so yeah, double blind is one solution. Another, and I think better solution is sign your reviews. And that means you're not going to be brutal. You're not going to be unkind. You're not going to be gratuitous or ad hominem. You should just state what the positives are and state what the negatives are. And, you know, be honest about it. And as you say, Corey, there's, there are people who wrote those papers. Um, and especially when we're talking about younger colleagues, um, we really should. We really should find ways to be positive. Other comments? That uh, I don't see the need to invent new new words for for or new terms for for this field. We have geographical ecology coined by Robert MacArthur in the seventies. I like that one a lot. Okay, so I think that wraps up a good discussion. Uh, everybody who is going to want a certificate from the course, you have one more week, and then. I'm going to close the responses to the, the, the course quiz. Um, and we will be done with this. But for the moment, thanks to everybody on this call. And um, we'll, I'll have this posted fairly soon for a broader audience to appreciate.